Hello, everybody. Welcome to SciArc, and uh, welcome to this evening's lecture. One would think that Seattle, the home of uh, this evening's speakers, Daniel Milley and Annie Hahn, had plenty to look at. After all, this is the land of Starbucks and the Space Needle, of Microsoft and the Microbrews, Clean Air, Dirty Rock, the Seahawks and the Mariners, and of rain and being sleepless. You'd think that this would provide one of the most complete and possibly the richest snapshots of early 20th century or 21st century, I should say, global culture. Lead Pencil's discussion entitled Looking at Nothing, followed by this Friday's presentation by Christopher Mitchell entitled Negations, a firm and intriguing form of resistance, a profound need to reset what is and what is not of value in the world as they find it here or in Rome, to switch off the noise to better register architecture's intensities, to blind the light in order to see anew. These are the essential discourses of a new, new generation, committed to the recovery of a primary experience and a renewed and more essential spatial problematic. As in the work of Cyrus's own emerging generation, embodied by Alexis Ross, Vlad, Orlo Collaborative, David Ross, Patrick Tide, Patterns, and so many others, along with the extraordinary work of students such as Simon Batista and Ben Rice, Christopher Norman, and Stephen Muff, one is facing the threshold of indeed making it new. It is the prerogative of each generation to both erase the tracks of what precedes it, to bury foundations, and to claim new ground. Resetting architecture sites, if you will, I think at Sire, this is our position. And here are the components of Lead Pencil's familiar new architectures. A linear plenum, a Seattle staircase, one more hill double, a four-part house, a garden wall, and so forth. These fluid and unfamiliar titles flow like the words of a Kurt Cobain lyric, binding the primitive to the existential, the visceral to questions of language. To help us unbind this labyrinth to better see how to look at nothing, please welcome the winners of 2007-2008's Rome Prize, Daniel Miholi and Daniel. There was a call out for 
a exhibition that was going to be a group show of architects who do artwork. So we applied and got in and um, did a joint piece together. It was a, sort of the first project that we had worked on as single sculpture together. And so we haven't been at this part of the sort of artwork portion very long as a team. But we found that uh, all the same skills that we would have that would come uh, useful in architecture are also useful in making sort of large scale artwork because the complexity is the same. There's all the same issues in terms of uh, one or the other of us work better with different people that are involved in the project. Uh, two heads are better than one. We share labor on everything and we share the conceptualizing it. So we have a very nice uh, soundboard uh, that's continual and always critical. So that's sort of um, the basis of where we began. It's, it's, uh, it's been a, a lot of work in the last five years has been large scale installation work. And we've sort of left a lot of the smaller studio work behind. So we don't do as much uh, drawing anymore. But this last year we were in Rome and um, had a lot of studio time. Um, so we did a lot of small scale work, a lot of drawings, and uh, we had a chance to do a lot of, uh, to begin a major new research project. So we'll talk about that as well. So very briefly, we'll just show a few projects so you can kind of get a sense of the, the sort of basic day-to-day -day architecture work that we do, which tends to be a lot of uh, remodels, small commercial office work for, um, for company, creative companies in Seattle. In this particular case, uh, this is our gallery in Seattle, the Laramore Project, that represents us, and he had a, uh, an old paint shop space that he needed to refurbish, so we built him um, a temporary sort of office space that sort of floats in the space, made of uh, all used materials. And front door and a little, uh, a little video nook. And this is a reception desk for uh, tooth and nail records in Seattle, an office space. So in this case, uh, uh, doing some of the fabricating ourselves and getting all the materials and assembling them on site. A lot of, a lot of metal work um, ends up in our projects. And we do yeah, quite a bit of furniture work as well, so we're involved um, at sort of all scales of the project. And, and the furniture is really the part that we enjoy quite a bit, getting our hands uh, dirty with. Okay, um, we promised you we'd show you mostly new work uh, from the last couple of years. Uh, we were here, I think, in 2005, um, before we did this very large project, Aerial Double. Um, we got a residency at the Hedman Center for the Arts, which was a really great place to spend uh, a few months if you ever had a chance to apply. I do believe they accept uh, architecture applications as well. Uh, and while we were there, we uh, met a curator at the Exploratorium at Science Museum there and, uh, and did this project which involved sort of looking at the, the sort of uncertainty of the building and construction process at the very beginning. When you begin the excavation and if you don't know what sorts of things you'll find, what sort of, sorts of soils are going to be um, inherent uh, below grade and uh, archaeological remains uh, underground rivers and those types of things all tend to show up in these wet climates. So we were very aware of that and photographing for quite a while that point in the project, which is excavation for footings. I think for me also, it's at the uh, very beginning of the project, and when we built the, uh, the four parts house, you guys might have seen it on our website, um, that the first thing that you do is you, you dig the site and get rid of the dirt. It's such a sort of mundane, non-material, and I think just looking at it and manipulating it with your hand, uh, there just seems so much uh, possibility at any given moment. You can enlarge it, you can make it smooth and round, whatever, that, that it's immediately kind of malleable in your hand. So that was the portion that we were just really intrigued about, the construction process. And I think I, our project changed a lot that we had a chance to, to build it ourselves and we were working on it. So the, the initial size of what we thought it was appropriate, looking at the drawings, because you know we do, as you guys do, uh, do a lot of things on the drawings, and then when you're on the site, really measuring up and physically kind of walking around the site, you, you change quite a bit of your perception of what the structure is going to be on the site. So with this piece at the Exploratorium, we were actually dying, we were dying to do a museum project that we can bring the dirt 
inside of the museum. Now, if you talk to any curators um, <coughs> in museums, that's like the one thing they they hate uh, bringing this materials. So there's mold and you know other uh, insects and those things involved. But the exp exploratorium uh, staffs were great, and they were really excited. So this was the first time that we were able to use this material in the indoors. So it's composed of um, sort of remnant uh, excavations and concrete uh, foundations and piers, sort of as, as though it's emerging out of the ground, but almost like a figment of the imagination. It's at that point um, where you're at a, in a project where you're sort of uncertain about which way it could go and, and where the sort of formation of the project might, might end up. Um, and it's a really exciting moment in time that we wanted to express or hold still for a moment so for people to observe. This is a, a part of the museum that's called the scene gallery. So the window on uh, your left-hand side is actually was a door before. We made it into sort of a uh, like a, a vitrine uh, or a diorama so that the, the kids and the viewers of the museum can come up to the window and look at this situation, uh, which had very much of a diorama appearance because of its sort of inward light. And where the camera is sitting is a bench where you could also come around through a back way and sit. So then you had a situation of viewers looking at people looking um, in sort of confusion. And it was, it's the one thing in the entire museum that doesn't have an explanatory panel. So everyone's sort of wondering you know, what it is, um, which is a great thing to have in a science museum because it is sort of, uh, more about that than anything else. There's a couple more shots. I wanted to kind of talk about the, the topography of the site before one starts to manipulate and, and create the site. So the, the fluorescent lamp we used is kind of insinuating that what might have been the landscape there before the site was shaped into kind of building formations. And these welded wire sculptures that are painted white, they're the ghost structures of sort of the foundations and things that are in the works uh, appearing as the, the building arrives at the site. So while we're at the headlands, um, you stay in these little uh, white barracks buildings, and it's usually for two or three months, um, and they serve us, and it's a fabulous place. It's so close to um, the Bay Bridge there, but you don't get cell phone service, so you're, you're pretty much uh, cut off from civilization unless you get on a bike or a car and get into town. Um, very bucolic setting. Uh, they gave us this great big room, but as soon as we got in there, they started painting the exterior of the building. So all the windows were actually covered up for the duration of our months there, so we never had any view unless we cut a little wall in plastic um, while they were painting. Uh, but we came, we sort of, I think that last slide shows, we, we set up, it seems like always like a little architecture office wherever we go. So this is us uh, not acting very much like artists, but uh, just reading and drawing, thinking about um, what might sort of take place. And this is a, a space where you just have an open house at the end. You aren't required to do a project per se. Um, we were looking at uh, the light coming into the space and how soft it was on the walls and, and wanted to sort of uh, capture that moment. So one of the studies that we did there um, was projecting when a certain time of day would al align with a pattern of light and then uh, drawing strings before it got there at that time of day. And that turned into this project here, oops, should back slower. Um, which we did at Laramore Project, the gallery in Seattle. So based on our, our studies and some of the observations from the Headland Sands, that uh, we, the, the gallery inside does not have any windows. It has four skylights. And so we created these two fictional windows uh, that we salvaged materials and reformulated to, to make these two black windows. And we calculated the, the angle of the moonlight that would come in at 2 a.m. at, I think it was May 27th, 2006, 2007? 2007. Um, so that is the kind of the shape of the light coming into the gallery space. What we were intrigued about um, studying this and looking at this is that you know, as an architect, you design buildings with fenestrations and windows and placement of the windows, solid versus void, all those things, just so that you can bring that, that quality of light into the space. 
So we designed the, the outside containers, but really what you really experience is that emptiness, that the space that this container contains. And it was really interesting to, to give physical presence to this moonlight, which you rarely see at 2 a.m. Well, maybe you guys see more than uh, most people, but to give a physical presence and then to see them occupy the amount of space because in natural light you just kind of go through, you don't think about it so much as that it has taken up much space. But once you structuralize and give its form, that it, it takes up a, a lot of space. So really, depending on where you put these windows and the angle of lights that are coming in, it is occupying a lot of that empty space within. And we were really interested to uh, observe how people behaved around these pieces and how people navigated. And if you were to actually deal with this kind of a physical presence of light, how would you behave in a, in a given space? This is a project that's um, coming up for us. We're just about ready to go into fabrication, and we're in the process of getting a shop that's big enough to do it. Um, we're, this is not a project. This is just a photograph of a, a billboard under construction, which is another a typology that we look at a lot, as I'm sure many of you do as well. Um, just fascinated by that unique American icon in the landscape and what it does to frame and uh, sort of delimit views. So, uh, again, some photographs that, that show the way we've been looking at that over the years. And we do quite a lot of uh, little sketches um, that sort of prepare us for a project that's coming up like this. Um, this is a public project for the border station between Vancouver and Canada on I-5. Um, it's a new border station getting ready for the 2010 Olympics in Whistler. And uh, Bolton said Jimmy Jackson is doing the main building and uh, we were hired by them and the GSA to do the public art project. So. This is actually an old board that we were looking at this typology of billboard structure and I think 2004 we had a, a show up in the Caribbean Sea. So we were you know, just looking at billboard structures. Once you take away the surface uh, advertisement, you know, what are you left with? You're left with this really amazing structure that could stand on a single pole. And so we were thinking about in terms of occupiable spaces within the cafe. And, you know, we're not the only one who's done this. There are many people who are interested in this. But I think we were just sort of interested in the way that you see so many billboards in the, our, our landscape and the advertisements, you know, on them, that a lot of them you don't really pay a lot of attention to. They're just there for you to see it and kind of forget about it. And we thought it would be kind of be fun to do a project that it's clearly a sort of occupiable architectural recognizable space, but you can't get there. That you you kind of have to admire and you just keep on driving. So this was kind of part of that that idea. We made a maybe seven foot or six foot tall model of that as we're looking at. So this is the project site for the border station, and um, I think I'm going to have to get the laser out for this this one here. Um, the border is actually this line here, and so um, this is Canada, this is the U.S. There's a, a really interesting um, structure right here that's a peace arch built by Sam Hill. This is the only land in the United States and Canada that's co-owned, and it's a, it's a park that's jointly owned together. So it, it is sort of an unusual gesture, and it is dedicated to peace between the two nations. Um, it actually has a piece of the Mayflower buried in the base of this, um, this archway. Um, which goes by the name of the Peace Arch Park. Um, so, uh, sort of going off the way of that framed landscape, um, it's changed over time and now uh, it's a great place for people to get out of their cars while they wait in horrendous lines uh, to get over the border between Canada and to the US. This is the sort of situation that's there now. Um, I don't have a picture of the new border crossing, but it will be similar in terms of the canopy and inspection booths. So we're looking at the sort of common um, parlance of uh, freeway signage that you experience on I-5 going into uh, Canada or into the U.S. There's a lot of duty-free signs as well that sort of show up just before you arrive. And, and it's not the best place to do any form of artwork just because of the anxiety that takes place with um, surveillance, um, uh, inspection, and questioning, and the sort of 
it, just the intensity of that environment is, uh, makes for a pretty awful place to experience uh, much besides panic. Um, yet, uh, when called to do um, a work in this location, it seemed like the best gesture was to do something that actually would be more automobile oriented because it's really not a place for pedestrians. So the site that we chose um, out of this whole area that was available was this little landscape mound that the landscape architects are going to plant with a, a wildflower and meadow grass. So that, that's the building Lowell and Sarah Jensen Jackson is doing a new border station. It's actually a really elegant building. It's in construction now. I'm excited for it. It's kind of a barren under the earth. So you know, the landscape takes over uh, the whole surrounding here. And what you're looking at here is the inspection uh, stations, all those things coming through. And they're, they're now making this kind of complex curve, so you can't just Black dart room. out of there. So you have to kind of keep on undulating your way through. So that, uh, looking at that site, it, it was kind of strange to choose that site because when we were out there, it, it doesn't look anything like the site plants there. They're, they're grading now. They're being continued to uh, grade the site. But from this, the site plan, we felt like we wanted to be away from the building a little bit and have people, give people the chance to kind of go through the inspections and then as they're coming out, that they're seeing this piece of sculpture. And it's a very simple gesture. It, it only does one thing, or maybe two things. It, it simply frames the sky beyond into the United States. So it's the very first thing you'll see is a little patch of uh, the clouds beyond. And then it has this, uh, this reference to that freeway cultures. Hopefully, um, reorienting the next billboard that you see and the one after that in a sort of different light. So it, for a moment, we'll take away the experience of that commercial environment um, along your route into the US. So we'll talk um, a little longer than usual on this project. We usually only show a few photographs, but um, but it seemed like a, a good one to sort of dwell on a little bit. So this is uh, Mary Hill Double, and it was funded by the Creative Capital Foundation of New York, which offers grants uh, also for architects um, and artists uh, every other year uh, for projects like this, which are sort of outrageous, I guess, something that you wouldn't ever do on your own. And we, we saw this grant come up and we're like, okay, this is something that we've always wanted to do. Let's go for it. And to our amazement, uh, we got the grant. And it's, it's, uh, it's uh, upriver from Portland, about two hours on the Columbia River. And the river is very wide at this location. It's about a mile and a half wide. It's, I think, four and a half hours from Seattle, the shortest route. And uh, this is the sort of landscape environment right at that site. Um, there's a big bend in the river. It's incredibly arid. There's only nothing grows here without irrigation, so they grow mostly winter wheat. And um, it has an amazing site history. This guy on the left, Sam Hill, uh, who was a big Northwest industrialist, part of the uh, James J. Hill uh, Railroad program running through the Northwest, also part of Bell Telephone. He built the first paved road in the United States, also in this area. Decided to build this country house out of solid concrete, three feet foot thick. I, that, I love this picture. <laughs> it, I mean, just take a look at this. There's, there's nothing around the site. It's sort of a crazy, windy, very, you know, the, the lightning striking landscape. And this is his house in, in what was it? 1907. 1907. So it's sort of a crazy, crazy idea, a crazy guy who wanted to have this, this house in the middle of nowhere. He never finished it while he was alive, um, but three of his mistresses, including one from San Francisco, got together to make it a museum after he passed away. And it happens to have the best Rodin collection outside of Paris. This is what it looked like uh, when it was finished as a museum. It has this sort of uh, European formal garden around it. Inside, is uh, it's all chopped up into little rooms that were really more suited for the country house that it was supposed to be. And it's all closed off with windows and shutters and bars uh, to keep the light out. Um, this aerial view shows the museum on the north side of the Washington side and about a mile and a half away to the south, uh, perpendicular is where we placed its double. It's actually about a 15 mile drive from one to the other. Um, and we'll show a few shots of us putting it together. Uh, we were warned about wildfire in our, our truck, which is very old, uh, that we were told was going to catch fire for the, for the grass. Uh, the first day we arrived there, there was in fact a huge wildfire right across the river and almost burned the museum down. 
Um, so that got us pretty scared uh, to do things right. We had some consultants out there in terms of scaffolding to help uh, figure out the logistics of getting it all out there. Um, we had a site surveyor help us out to locate the exact location within a few inches. And a scaffolding company with three men came out for um, so three days yeah, to help set up the major structure. And then Annie and I spent the next three weeks uh, getting the netting on site and then hoisting it in, into place. Had a lot of insect troubles out there, uh, putting rattlesnakes and black widows and flying ants and weird giant mosquito things. Had a big uh, lightning storm with 7,000 lightning strikes on the night before the opening, which uh, was really frightening. Uh, big wind storms were always kind of shredding this thing up. They have huge, it's a big uh, wind surfing capital of North America, so because of that, uh, this was not the best site for a sculpture, um, but it made it the three months that it was up. So it was up for three months in 2006, and we never did get permission from the museum uh, to do this project. They, we actually first proposed it on the lawn right adjacent to the museum, and they rejected it. Um, we asked them if, if we came up with money, would they, would they allow it? And they said maybe, and then we got that grant. And then we came back with the grant, and they still didn't want the project anymore. So then that's when we decided to select this new location, which turned out to be fantastic in terms of its siting. Um, so we had this very odd relationship where here we are like staring off with the museum, and all their ordinary museum goers uh, would go there and then like, wonder what that was across the way. And they didn't provide very much in terms of information. What uh, what interested and initiated this project for us? It was a three-year long in making. Is that um, you can see between the, the chimney stacks the blue netting across the, the gorge there in the photograph um, was that we, we drive through this landscape a lot when we go from Seattle to Portland, um, mainly because we love the landscape there and uh, find it fascinating that this building, this strange looking building, is sitting there um, all by itself. And the building from exterior is very striking and very impressive, um, very monumental. When you go inside the building, however, it, as if you've seen in the photographs, it's all kind of cut into smaller rooms because it was meant to be somebody's house. And we've always kind of thought of or dreamed uh, of this interior space, one unified space that was as impressive as it was seen from the outside. And we wanted to make the exact replica of the volume of the museum initially right next to the museum. So when you go to the landscape, experience the landscape, get in there, look at the, this massive museum, and then next to it sitting the, the uh, non-existing interior of this museum. Uh, at the end, we ended up putting across the river, and I think it was better, because you go to the museum, and then you, you drive another seven miles to come to this empty space. And we wanted to make it out of this color, blue color netting, because, you know, I think designing space is about, you know, like I said, containing an emptiness. And in this case, it really felt like we were taking a part of the sky and somehow making a small gesture, a very minimal gesture, to contain that, that volume. And so we were looking around for the exact color of the, the netting, and we actually found it from this German company and had to ship it over. And it took us about three weeks to put them together. This is a video that, that we produced. It's actually one of three <coughs> other two. Well, all three are actually on YouTube if you want to see some of the low res versions. Oh, um, we want to have a little technical. Taking photographs one, one step apart. And it took a 
about uh, 360 photographs to go around once. And it's done on a path that's in a lip shape around the key, so it gets sort of closer on the flat side, on the larger side, further away on the narrow one. We went around them on different times of day, different times of the year, just to sort of capture the different light quality that, that took place uh, on, this, on the structure. Uh, visitors could come out because it was only open on the weekends, and we uh, were sitting at a little, a little structure so that after we took it down and then it'll back up a little bit well. Sorry to put you through this long video. There's only one.
place just dried up and all the houses we built for them were uh, burned down over the years. So it's a very, it's a very uh, sort of a strange history. Um, I, think, I think also what I've, I've learned was doing this project is, is a, as an architect, you have this kind of dangerous desire when you go to this beautiful, pristine landscape. Like you imagine this cool project you want to do. And it, I, I, really, I do think it's a dangerous desire um, to, to, to have that is one thing, and actually for you know, many of us to have to, to do this all the time in this beautiful landscape. And I, I think for me that if I were given a chance to do a project in this you know, untouched virgin landscape, it has to be as of an emotional one as the landscape uh, presents or that su suggests or uh, gives to us. And so, and I don't know what that means and how it would be interpreted into the projects, but I, you know, oftentimes you go out to this really great landscape and this rich person who owns the land has this awful building sitting there. And it just kind of made me think of it, sitting there observing this light conditions of the landscape and all the things and uh, animals and other things that live there. And that responsibility that you have when you, when you are given a site like this as an architect, and, and what is your first initial gesture going to be, and how is it going to change the land? And that, that sort of sentiment was what was weighing on us on this particular site. And so at the end, um, all the scaffolding was picked up by the same crew and us, and, uh, and that blue netting went back into, into the, the netting stream that is used around Portland. So um, it's shown up there a few times already. Um, just this uh, earlier this year, while we were in Rome, we had a chance to, to do a, um, a single uh, piece at the Weatherspoon Art Museum in North Carolina, Greensboro. And uh, we were looking a lot at that moment about the way that we sort of live our lives in these uh, mostly rectangular rooms and the sorts of ways that, that, that we are given culturally to sort of occupy them from, from early on. There's all kinds of pressures uh, for you to organize and curate your own spaces in a particular way based on your age. And of course, the reality is quite different uh, when you finally get your first place, whether it's uh, you know, your first apartment. And uh, Microsoft uh, has other designs for you, the way you're going to live in the future. But it hasn't changed a lot, it seems, in the last 100 years. This is another dorm room. This is a museum that's on a college campus, so we were thinking a lot about the way that, uh, that people first begin to live in their own, in their own way, away from the house. Um, and there's a, a lot of societal pressure also to declutter your lifestyle um, and a way to rate yourself online. And then, of course, a lot of companies that want to sell you ways to organize the uh, otherwise messy lifestyle. And architects have other ideas as well. Um, so this project, um, we were looking for a volunteer from the university community to, to act as um, basically a laboratory where we would go in and measure everything in, in the house and measure the room and measure and document all the objects. So there, uh, a woman stepped up who went to the university but had been living in her own place for 10 years in the same, same one, uh, one bedroom apartment. And so uh, the, the space was completely documented and we went and bought uh, with our budget uh, uh, used equivalents of every item that she owned um, or or close proximities to to whatever it was that she had and so like not the same chair but something a stuffed chair that looked very much the same not the same clothing but clothing in the same color palette and then we just tidied up the room from the way that she was living before and just stacked up things so that it wasn't really about we didn't want to make a comment about her in particular, we wanted to make a comment about the way that we live in these rectangular rooms and the way that we push objects to the perimeter if we don't have space and the way that they sort of begin to form piles and the way that, they, that we collect them into objects. We paint them all one color gray in an effort to sort of neutralize them so you didn't know what books she read or what art she had on the wall or what CDs she owned, but just that they were also rectangular objects stacked in like, like ways on shelves it's really interesting when, when she came to the opening with her friends to look at you know, exact same items and um, how we'd organized the space because it was a little more cleaner than how she had organized it by, by painting.
painting it in one color, she could kind of see how she had organized to navigate this space. And that was our primary interest, that people move into these kind of combined spaces and they collect all these things, and then they push things aside and make ways so they can navigate within this space. We left um, all her personal items unpainted, anything that touched her body, so her shoes, any clothing that she had around there, or jewelry, we left un unpainted, so that had some some sort of biographical um, component that could sort of reference back to the, the woman in that particular case. Uh, but the rest of the material was painted in neutral color. Um, we've been looking a lot at these sort of diaphanous enclosures around, around town in Seattle, um, and that's another thing that we photograph a lot, uh, the way that spaces uh, carved out and kept away from one another with these really lightweight like what is the sort of minimum that you can do to sort of demarcate a spatial enclosure? And uh, in response to those, uh, we decided we would do a project that sort of described the spatial enclosure of a shipping container uh, proportion. So this is a, a, a single length one, only 20 feet long. And it's made with welded wire, which is a material that we, we turn to quite a bit sort of to describe a sort of atmosphere around an object. Uh, this is made entirely of a uh, rebar tie wire that's straightened and then welded um, with thousands of tiny welds and a jeweler's tip on an oxyacetylene torch. And this is suspended in space. It's one of those cities, as, as there are many cities in uh, Europe, that architects study a lot. And there, there isn't a single building or stone that hasn't been studied. So it's to the point that it's so over familiar that you kind of don't look at those things anymore. And so of course we studied those things when we went to architecture school. And we weren't so interested in those individual buildings or objects per se, but we wanted to discover something else. We wanted to discover perhaps discarded spaces or left out spaces, leftover spaces, or, or things that weren't really meant to, to be occupied uh, between buildings and see what we could find. So we um, used this, this uh, scanning system called LIDAR, and Leica ended up sponsoring, Leica Italia uh, ended up sponsoring our project. So we used this very expensive equipment whenever they lend us equipment went out on the streets and uh, started to scan uh, some of the streets and buildings that we found interesting. We, we weren't sure what, what we were going to do and what we would find. We would find anything interesting, but we were interested in the idea of looking at those things in a very familiar places. I just realized, um, I fooled us. We, we actually have this title here, but it, um, it's it's actually going to be in a few more slides. I had to take it and move it to the end because of our videos weren't working again. So these are these are drawings that we did in Rome, but they don't relate to the looking at nothing project. So um, we'll have to go through a few of these before we get to that. Um, <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so this so while we were working on those projects, these are some of the works that uh, uh, were produced in Rome uh, the year that we spent there, and these are probably uh, six foot by five foot tall drawings that we've never done with in night drawings. We've only always done the daylight drawing, so we decided to do a couple of large-scale drawings. And these, these drawings, again, they're kind of um, our years of looking at empty parking lots in the United States mostly, and when we were over there, we were doing the same thing. It has a very strange presence, as you guys probably know, is that it's pristine, it's totally clean, there's nothing there, and it's always impeccably lit. Um, and and it's a great sight to sort of Look, look at, at that sort of um, the, the culture that has been wrought on the American landscape, and also one that has been imported into Italy. So in this particular situation, it's uh, some sort of excavation is taking place, and, and two advertising structures are sort of squaring off uh, against one another. And we felt like a, that's a 
that's one of those other perfect sites that interesting events or installations could take place. So just kind of a, a bunch of, a, a few ideas that we came up with a potential installation like this. So this is one. And these sort of begin as uh, ideas in our sketchbook, um, in our individual sketchbooks. And then when, I, when we're ready to do a drawing, we'll, we'll begin to talk about what it is uh, about a particular idea that's worth drawing, and then we critique each other for days and sometimes months until we feel like we've got a common idea that's sort of worth um, committing to draw for a month. These take about a month um, just because of their, their scale and uh, complexity. It's, these are mostly charcoal, graphite, and uh, white pencil. And we did this piece also while we were in Rome at the, at the gallery at the academy there. Um, this, this one is titled The Adoration Between Yellow, and we kind of wanted to talk about you know, we had done a lot of projects where the light was coming inside and we wanted to do a piece that was a, a light, insinuating uh, artificial light coming from within to outside, like a, almost like a vomit uh, that was splattering all over the walls and onto the floor. So it was kind of a, a conceptual piece. This one we did just, um, uh, just as we got back from Rome, it was a piece that we conceptualized there. It's for a show that's up right now in Seattle. It's titled Accumulation. I'll, I'll move through these fast because I think we're running a little, a little long. And this is not in Rome again. These are, um, these are two pieces that we just did at, at the Boise Art Museum. We just finished uh, a couple days ago. We just came back from there. And uh, this, is, this piece is called After. And it's a billboard that we made from uh, salvage building parts. And it's uh, designed to decay over its lifespan of seven months at the museum and it's sitting on top of uh, building rubble from the uh, museum renovation. <coughs> this is uh, also after sort of a dual piece, and they're also looking at one another. The, the billboard piece likes this piece uh, on the interior at nighttime. And this is a 350 square foot, uh, which we feel like is the optimum size for an individual. So if you're two people, you get 700 square feet. Um, and it sort of is a thought about sort of the, the way that, that uh, American housing is going in terms of 100% uh, foam construction and some hard coat popping. And it's sitting on top of a bed of aggregate that's carved out with a rectangular footing demarcating the, the foundation area. And it's not really clear if it's coming or going in this case. Maybe it's both the lifespan being so short. Okay, so we're going to get to looking at nothing, I promise you. <laughs> but we put it at the end for a good reason. Okay, so here's a couple of projects that we didn't get the last the last year and a half. Uh, we, we have been applying for several um, public art projects and commissions to try our hand at that. And uh, this one was a really nice project at the, the Cancer Research Center in Seattle that we didn't get. It sort of involves five histories uh, that took place on the site and they're rendered as sections all layered on top of one another that serve as sort of a, a termination of this area of the campus. So we didn't get that one. We didn't get this one either. This one is in Arizona for a giant soccer complex. Uh, Dennis Oppenheim ended up getting this project. And uh, sort of based on uh, a project that we had done a few years ago called Inversion that sort of draws the atmosphere and leaves a void in the center that's occupied. And we another project we didn't get in Texas for uh, an art collector. We didn't go for this one. Uh, oh, can you even see that one? There's like a little rectangular closure that sort of describes a secondary building on the edge of, uh, of his uh, Marie complex in Houston. And then another one we didn't get uh, in, in the Seattle area. While we were in Italy, we, we took a lot of photographs and did a lot of um, editing instead of sketching. And there were, these are all sort of reductive drawing uh, photographs. So we were photographing and then only removing information from it, not changing color, not changing scale. Um, and so these are just some of the things that we saw in Italy that sort of in another way of looking at the Italian landscape and the way that uh, modernity has sort of creeped in alongside of it. So you won't see any of these slides stone or 
antiquity, uh, but just like this is a ticket booth of the Colosseum, for example. And we do these just for our benefit to sort of um, continually generate just new ways of viewing the world around us. Okay, so here we are, the very last part. Um, so we do owe a lot to the Leica. They, they lent us this, uh, this machine, which is um, cost as much as a, a house. Um, I was very nervous to carry it around. I think that we're the only um, artists who have had a chance to use it yet. It's, it's not brand new, it's been around 10 years, but it's taken a while to get to the point where it's actually portable enough and fast enough to be really broadly applicable to a lot of, a lot of different sectors. It was developed for the petroleum and mining industry to sort of map complex spaces. And uh, I should describe a little bit about what it does. Here's a couple of shots from early um, high density scanning machines, uh, also known as LIDAR. Uh, they do it for mapping, aerial mapping cities to find out what sort of density and forest cover there is. And they also use it uh, on the right there in like a, a petroleum plant to figure out where all the pipes are, where they can fit new pipes, sleeve them in between. We first got this, the very first generation, which was developed in California, actually by uh, an entrepreneur for the petroleum industry, and then it was sold to Leica, and then Leica then developed it later. And you've probably seen some of these used in like small modeling projects, um, where you can scan, you know, like a microphone and then make a model out of it. This is sort of that same principle, but uh, on the scale of the environment. This is a pile of still studs in the studio in, in Rome that we, this is our very first scan and it sort of shows what it does. It, it shoots the laser out and gets millions of measurements, uh, very, very fine grain, as fine as you want really, enough to measure, say, text on a paper cup. Um, and it, it's registered as, as thousands of little points and they call it a point cloud. And then you can stitch them together, various scans, and create interior and exteriors, cut sections, it's, really useful for uh, as-built people, and especially studying uh, older buildings. Find out where every stone is and how off, how out of square. Um, so we actually used it to scan several sites uh, in, in the center of Rome, uh, around Pantheon in particular, and then uh, on the lower right, a long street in the, in the Jewish quarter. So this is us sitting there. That's sort of the whole setup. You have this giant battery box that you have to lug around, which is really hard to do in Rome. And then uh, you have to have carry a laptop, and then the machine has to go in a really tender padded box. And we were looking at these sorts of spaces. Um, this is the street that we scan in, in particular. Uh, it's about a half a mile long. And we wanted to sort of capture all the incredible complexity of the real world um, as it is and get it into get it into the digital world where we can start to manipulate it. And the complexity of this is, is such that it's really almost impossible to capture through any analog means. It, it can't be surveyed very well. Um, everything is so out of whack in every possible way that you can build. There's so many layers of history. Um, so we we're really interested in that aspect. <coughs> we, we won't play the, the video. There's, just kind of go through the Okay. Pictures. Yeah, we're going to have to wait until the end because we know that it's going to try something, so we'll wait for the end to show some of the clips of video of it. So this is how accurate the scan is. This is the, the obviously the photograph of the building. This is the scan. And then it can lay that photograph on top of this uh, this sort of topographical information. And, and then you can take that into any parametric modeling program and then do it any way you want to. But um, I mean, the wonder of it is that it really captures everything, uh, all the detail that you might have in a photograph, but it's all spatial information accurate within a few millimeters, um, over 200 feet. So um, this is a shot of a, a little van that happened to be near this, uh, one of the scans that we had. And you can kind of see in the background there, somebody walked in front of the scan while we were running it, and it cuts a section through them also. So if we were to sort of rotate this around, you can see their exact profile. Um, it shoots the scan linear, uh, in a linear fashion vertical, so it runs these sort of linear lines up and down the facades captures 500,000 points every second. Um, and it's, uh, so these are just sort of straight shots of stuff that we captured. And then we started to take this data and to start to uh, start to use it as information to sort of propose site-specific installations in Rome. So this is one street. Um, all, all the facades overlaid on top of one another into a total collision. 
uh, which doesn't make any sense anymore. This is also another street where every facade is, uh, is overlapped orthogonally onto one another, forming a, a secondary space. Another screenshot from that. Um, this is a video that we'll show in a second. These are all the windows in one particular intersection, all in their original location, but all the rest of the architecture is stripped away, so it becomes sort of a salon-style uh, view of the, of the way that windows are operating on space and the way that um, sort of that sort of human interface uh, and, and the way that windows sort of puncture holes through buildings. Okay, so we'll, since that's, that's pretty much the end of the lecture, I'm going to shell out just for a second and try to get that, these little videos up so you can see them. These are about um, a minute long videos. And the, the last image you saw is a, a video of scan. So we scanned the both side of the street and lined the two walls together and, and made a fenestration or opening where the windows or the doorways matched up. And surprisingly, they are very, very similar. So we came out with another kind of a third wall. So this is sort of rotating view of what that presents. So, I mean, for us, these I just yelled at the microphone. I'm sorry about that. Um, for us, these are um, these are actual like ideas for projects, not realized yet. So they're just sort of preliminary thoughts about how we might begin to use this data, making this in this case uh, maybe out of some sort of uh, welded wire mesh again. Um, we go back to some of the other ones and put you out. Oh, I can show you the side of the hand. So this is one, one side facade of the Pantheon. Not a sculpture project, just a didactic study. And the, the last one I'll show you a window piece showing the scanning of the street, taking away the walls, and just looking at the window as a main means to kind of coordinate yourself. So I think what makes these so interesting is that they are they're so specific to a place and you can capture all that detail and all, all of its in, in, just infinite detail is all there and the way to produce that and to start to use that as sort of a building block for us offers a lot of um, a lot of interesting possibilities. So we want to we want to continue using this and to keep looking at the way that Rome is different than Los Angeles and different than Seattle and the way that the spatial environments work in urban locations. And, uh, and then start to start to uh, build a couple of these ideas that are that are really you know non buildings. Um, anything you want to say in summary? Um, I, I think artists' fascination about doing both architecture and art is that they are very separate. You know, people ask us that all the time, like uh, uh, one of them influencing another, you know, vice versa. And I think, of course, um, it's not sort of consciously we're doing this project. It's gonna it's gonna affect our next architecture projects, but because we are interested in space and kind of the, the quality of the enclosed space, they must be influencing, influencing each other. I think what distinguishes um, art from architecture and the works that we do is that we're really uh, fascinated with this, this spaces. I mean, architecture is all about function and program and kind of precisely uh, coming up with the solutions for that. Artwork, um, on the other hand, for us, is it's it's just the space. It has no purpose whatsoever. It doesn't have any function. So it's the space without architecture, without any of its functions, and that's what separates the work for us. 
And we, I think maybe because we're tra trained as an architect, we're fascinated with the kind of the, the construction process and the, the built building aspect of architecture, the, the functional aspect of architecture. But on the other hand, we're very, very interested with the, this, this architecture with no use for it whatsoever. Um, so that's why we're kind of still working on those two, two subjects. All right, well, um, we would love to take any questions if anybody has any. Um, is, is that part of the program? We can talk about that. Questions, yes? Yes. Yes, okay. Are there any questions out there? We can take a few questions. Maybe we can light the, the room too, so I don't know. Hi, Hi. Hi. You told me it's an all And at the same time, it's this kind of deliberate Focus. And I'm trying to figure out what one has to do with yeah, this kind of distracted view of the absolute focus and precise view. How does the precision of the camera and the distraction of the kind of not looking at anything in particular come together? It's a great question. Um, I think that, uh, well, we, we, we come from um, an architecture background, but we've done a fair amount of photography. So we spent a lot of time in front of um, large and medium format cameras, and, and there is a totally different process and a different way of looking at the world and a different intentionality when you have to take uh, a photograph through a very laborious process and where the setup of the equipment requires um, a great amount of time and labor versus uh, you know, taking a snapshot or, uh, or just looking at something and trying to remember it later, making a little notation in your sketchbook. Those are totally different sort of practices. They both involve looking at the world. It both involves some form of intentionality, but I think that that the Leica scanner is is like a large format camera, and the complexity of it requires requires a sort of dedication. You, you have to sort of stage your, your presence. Where, how, where am I going to bring this huge piece of equipment? How am I going to get permission to set it up? And then is it really worth doing? Is this worth that sort of work? Or the other sort of form of looking, say, taking snapshots and modifying them, is a, is a very sort of passive form of, of observing the world. And, and we enjoy that aspect as much because it's a, it's a generator and it's a way to loosen up. I think like the intentional photography can be very deliberate, but it can also be very constricting. And there's a, there's a wonderfulness about just walking through the world and simply observing, capturing, taking back to your studio, analyzing, distilling. Maybe only after capturing a thousand photographs of something do you finally find something that's actually worth looking at or you feel is worth looking at. And then later you might take a larger piece of equipment or actually begin to turn that into something that's, that's more meaningful to you. But they are, I think, totally different. I think that's, that's a good observation. And we, we, didn't, we don't make a distinction like I can see that in our talk that we we aren't making a distinction between the sort of informal looking and the more formal looking. Um, but I think that I think that it's there is clearly a difference between the two. I think I would agree. I, I mean, I I always thought that sort of you know the photographer's work when you look at them, they're sitting there on whatever the site and looking for that precise moment when they see something that is very kind of descriptive of that moment. So I think it's more than just a kind of capturing the, the real thing that you see, but the capturing the emotional feeling that you have for that space. So depending on who's taking photographs, it would be completely two different photographs. So it's, it's abstract, um, nevertheless, how real it looks. And I think using this very precise camera that marks, you know, it, much more than what we can describe and, and draw, and then bringing back that information and actually manipulating it seems like we're taking just kind of a snapshot in a way, and looking for the precise moment. It was interesting. There was a there's a doctor named Tim Davis who had the who had the same award at the American Academy, and he shoots large format photography and was out every day, deliberately going all over Rome, looking at sort of antiquity and new antiquity was the title of his of his project. And I think like he would probably love to have a chance to use this piece of equipment, but it's so rare at the moment um, to be able to get your hands on it. I, I think one day when the price comes down to something, you know, the cost of a new car, then, then photographers will start to use this and we'll start to see an explosion of this particular use. But uh, in, in our case, we're, so much of 
our use was really just learning how to use the piece of equipment, learn the software, learn how to, you know, not to break it uh, for Leica and get it back in their safe hands. And we only really had it about ten times during our entire years. So it would come at a at a sort of infrequent interval whenever they weren't using it for something else. And we see an incredible amount of potential for this as a tool for looking at the world. Um, and we're excited to see sort of uh, see it used by other people as well. So part of our part of our program is to sort of proselytize and share this information with people and then get other people sort of interested in it so that it can be used in other ways. Okay, well thank you thank all. Thank you, Ray. Oh. <laughs> okay, <laughs> what? I have sort of a funny question, but I don't know if I can express it. It seems like you're looking at space from the outside, or it's not, but it feels like it feels like you're trying to capture the interior of space and present it to be seen from the outside. And I'm here in a second to be about it. It's mm -hmm. like you, it's like a lot of this experience architecture is moving through. Your art to see almost is always capturing something that you move through, but looking at it from without. And that makes sense. That's a comment on that. Yeah, I, um, I would have to think about that a little more to find out if I, if I agree with that. I think for us, it's it's probably all about being inside the space, but I think that maybe the the limits of presentation. Um, might have something to do with that. For for us, the the experience of, of space is paramount over looking at space as an object. So hopefully, if you have a chance to view any of these things in person, like Mary Hill Double, I think is a good example. You can see it in space as an object carved out from the sky on this on this, uh, this terrain. But it was also something that we very much wanted people to go experience, so they were able to go and spend time walking through it, climb up the staircase, look at it from above and below from all angles. So it was intended to be a spatial experience in its entirety. And what we're left with here, you know, in a slideshow and a video is looking at it primarily from the outside. And I think that might have something to do with the limits of our ability for documentation. But I'll definitely I'd love to think a little more about that. Yeah, I like to think about that. It's, a, it's interesting when people give us feedback about you know, your presentation is all about that, or your work is all about sort of that. We don't have that that view, so it's actually an interesting observation. Thanks for that. Hey. Sure. Thank, Thank you very much, guys.